Welcome. It's great to have you here for the, it's actually the 20th Martin B. Hickman Outstanding Scholar Lecture here in the college. I'm uh, Dean Ben Ogles. Grateful to have you here for the, for the lecture. We have with us tonight three of uh, Martin Hickman's daughters, Allison and Heather and Melissa. I'm just trying to, there they are, right over here, sitting right on the front row. We're very grateful to have, have them here with us representing the Hickman family. Um, Martin Hickman, of course, was uh, Dean of, of the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences for 17 years. He's, uh, unfortunately, he's the only Dean of the college in his past that I, w uh, that I never met, and I, I wish that I had had that opportunity. He was a remarkable man, and this uh, lecture uh, series was created to honor the uh, work that he did in the college during his time as, as Dean. If you look on your program, you'll see a, a bio there of Dean Hickman. He was instrumental in creating the Women's Research Institute and the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, the Family Study Center, and other research efforts. Uh, some consider him the father of University's American Heritage Program. Uh, conceived, he conceived of it and organized its creation along with other faculty. He was very loyal to the college and participated in many many initiatives in the college early in its uh, creation. So we're pleased to have the Hickman family here. We're pleased that we can have this lecture series and we're pleased to have Craig Harleen here from the history department who will be giving our lecture this evening. Along with having the opportunity to give the lecture, the outstanding scholar is awarded an increase in salary, $4,000 and has $4,000 for their research to help fund their research. So it's quite an honor to be selected for this. In addition to Dr. Harleen, his some of his family are here and we'd like to recognize them, his parents, Lloyd and Kay, and his wife Paula and uh, daughter Kate. And I understand there are others from the extended family here, maybe a sister and brother-in-law, aunts, nieces. How many nieces do you have again? 40. 40, 40 nieces. So I don't know if they're all here, but he has a lot of them. I would like to announce at this time as well, it's in your program, that next year's lecture will be delivered by Ginny Roby, a professor in the School of Social Work. She was at a conference and we cannot recognize her here today, but we would like to congratulate Ginny Roby and look forward to hearing from her next year. Our invocation this evening will be offered by Ridge Wallace, a history major and TA for Dr. Harleen from Fairfield, Montana. Following the invocation, Dr. Chris Hodson, a professor in, in the history department, will uh, introduce Dr. Harleen before his lecture. Ridge. Uh, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Craig Harleen as the 2013 Martin Hickman lecturer. Um, I'm Chris Hodson. I teach in the history department here at BYU and have for the last six years, and it's been my honor to be one of Craig's colleagues. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Craig's uh, career. Uh, Craig uh, earned a BA uh, in history, or excuse me, in European studies from BYU. Uh, he has a PhD from Rutgers University. Uh, he's taught at BYU since 1992. He's also taught at the University of Antwerp, uh, the Catholic University of Leuven, and the University of Idaho. Um, he has won awards, fellowships, and prizes too numerous to uh, mention uh, in total. Uh, but the highlights include fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Royal Flemish Academy for Science and the Arts, and prizes from the 16th Century uh, Society and Conference. And just this year, his latest book was a finalist for the prestigious Mark Linton Prize from Columbia University's School of Journalism. Uh, Craig's publications and research focus on, but, but and this is crucial, are not limited to, uh, the subject of lived religion during the era of the Reformation in Europe. Craig has written, uh, written or edited uh, many, many scholarly articles and by my count, seven books 
uh, including The Burdens of Sister Margaret, Inside a 17th Century Convent, published in 1994, Miracles at the Jesus Oak, uh, Histories of the Supernatural in Reformation Europe, published in 2003, uh, Sunday, A History of the First Day from Babylonia to the Super Bowl, published in 2007. And finally, his most recent book, Conversions, Two Family Stories from the Reformation and Modern America, which was published by Yale University Press in 2011. Uh, when Dean Ogles asked me to introduce uh, Craig, I of course asked Craig for his CV, uh, upon which Craig said, oh, you're just going to pick out all the obscure and embarrassing stuff, and that's what you're going to say when you introduce me. Now, a person such as myself, that, that never would have occurred to me, um, <laughs> but since Craig brought it up, um, I do want to point out Craig's uh, towering presence in the media, uh, especially in radio. Now, obviously, every generation has its media moments that become kind of cultural touchstones. You remember where you were when this happened. Uh, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast, the Beatles' appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, televised Watergate hearings. For many of us, uh, that moment uh, happened during Craig's appearance on The Gene Dean Show on WRVC in Huntington, West Virginia. <laughs> and who among us could forget his turn on The Vic McCarty Show on WMKT in Charlevoix, Michigan, <laughs> or Radio Vlaanderen Internationale in Belgium. Um, now, of course, I'm joking about this, and Craig has, in fact, made uh, many, many uh, uh, very large-scale media appearances on the Today Show, on NPR, uh, Sunday Morning with Charles Osgood, and plenty of other kind of high-profile uh, places. But I, I do think that these obscure radio appearances actually teach us something really, really important about Craig's work. Um, so many of us in the Academy, and I include my, myself in this category, tend to write and to speak in the discipline-specific, explicitly technical, and sometimes jargon-riddled languages of our own subfields. Uh, we think plenty about the arguments that connect us, sometimes in belligerent ways, to our colleagues, but probably not enough about translating, not, not dumbing down, but translating our ideas into languages that connect us to the broader public, listeners of Gene Dean, Vic McCarty, and Radio Vlaanderen Internationale included. Now, if this tendency amounts to a crisis, and some observers, in fact, think it does amount to an intellectual crisis in our country, then Craig's work, I think, offers us one very difficult solution. And that is to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig in archives big and small until you find the really, really great documents. And then use those documents to make arguments about the biggest ideas of their historical moment, taking care, of course, that those arguments get smuggled into readers' brains via stories that read like the best of novels. Then demonstrate how people right now, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues at work, are in fact wonderfully like the people from the past. Uh, lather, rinse, repeat. And that's essentially what Craig has done. Um, and now it seems uh, that uh, Craig's pen is nibbed and he is ready to unleash all of these interpretive talents on the long neglected uh, subject of pants. Um, so without any further ado, let's have Craig tell us what in fact did happen to those bell bottoms. So Craig Harleen. Thanks very much for the introduction, Chris, and thanks to Dean Ogles for the invitation to deliver the lecture and to the Hickman family for continuing to support it, and thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Well, many years ago, I climbed into an airport van in St. Louis with eight or nine other historians who'd been attending the famous 16th Century Studies Conference. We chatted merrily, telling hilarious inside jokes about the 16th century until, <laughs> until the driver of the van suddenly boomed out, so what have you all been doing here? Silence. We all knew exactly what we and 600 other historians had been doing here, talking about the 16th century. But we weren't sure how to explain that to a normal person. <laughs> Finally, somebody had the nerve to say, we all studied the 16th century. Silence again. Mindful of his tips, the driver finally said politely, well, I guess somebody's got to do it. And he... <laughs> well, that event and 900 others like it had a big impact on me. 
Historians do actually have good reasons for doing what we do. We plaster them up on the walls of history departments and utter tired platitudes, hoping that these will satisfy people so we can get back to work. If you're really lucky, you don't even have to explain why you study history, because you happen to study subjects people think are important, like something to do with their country, or religion, or their family, or historical celebrities, or of course, war. But what if you, like I, study obscure people who lived in Europe a lot of centuries ago? Or what if your motto for choosing a research subject might as well be, anything that sounds exciting or that you've heard of, I probably don't study. <laughs> well, then you've got some serious explaining to do, and we, including me, don't always do a very good job of it, as evidenced in the van. So here are a series. Chris has mentioned some of the obscure books. Here's a book about obscure nuns a book about a long obscure bishop, but at this time he was pretty famous, uh, some books about miracle seekers, obscure of course, and then obscure converts. <clears throat> but the Hickman lecture is a good moment to try explaining what your research and your discipline in general might be good for. Contrary to what assorted family members think, history is not just good for becoming a whiz at Jeopardy or other games that make you the life of any party. It's not even just good for developing writing and analytical skills because lots of disciplines do that. No, what history is most good for, even really old history, is the insight it can offer into life right now. Maybe the most fundamental insight really old history has to offer is some perspective on change. That's what my current research is about and my talk tonight. Historians don't so much study the past as they study change in the past in every realm of life. My books I've just mentioned study changes in European religious life during the Reformation, while one other book looks at changes in Sunday practice over many centuries. But what I want to emphasize tonight is not a particular change in a particular place and time, but change itself. What's to be learned from the very fact that things change, especially in my favorite realms of life, religion, and culture? You don't have to study really old history to notice religious and cultural change, of course. Just about anyone halfway paying attention in life will see it right before their eyes, moving from one generation to another. You all know how it goes. You grow up learning how your parents do and see things. You mostly go along until you get a little older, when you start doing and seeing more like your friends. You even get the exciting feeling that you're helping to fi fix what's wrong with your parents' world, especially in the obvious ways of clothing and hairstyles and music and dancing and movies, but also in abstract values. You're not just making the world different, but better. Your parents are, of course, alarmed and don't believe these changes are better at all. In fact, they believe it's their job to save you from them. You yourself don't accept all the changes going on, but you're not threatened by them the way your parents are, so that even if you're, say, a Mormon boy in the 60s and 70s, you can pick and choose the changes you like and feel great about it, like maybe longer hair, <laughs> or colorful clothes and stunning bell bottoms and lapels. <laughs> and I mention the temple here because this is temple wear clothing, you know, temple ready clothing. <laughs> Um, you, you can even wear stunning bell bottoms abroad in far off places. People younger than I often ask, were you the only one wearing these pants? I can assure you, I was not. There were a lot of people wearing these pants. If you're a Mormon girl, maybe you had epic battles over skirt lengths and nylons. And not because you're necessarily trying to get your parents mad or because you think everything about your new culture is great, but because of a lot of it seems natural and right to you. You're not completely different from your parents, but as you get into your late teens and early 20s, you're different enough that when you hear them talking to their friends, you understand the words, but think to yourself, what in the heck are they talking about? In the end, you revel in the changes, proud of your innovations and edgy music and new clothing and values. Then you get married and have kids, and you're sure those kids will thank you for what, for what you and your generation have brought by doing things just the way you did. But then your very own flesh and blood somehow don't appreciate how hip and progressive you are, so unlike your own old-fashioned parents. Pretty soon you're sitting around with your friends shaking your heads and saying, kids these days. You complain about their music and language and dancing and wonder why they even bother to wear pants if they're not going to bother to pull them up. And one, one of your friends will try to find a little hope by saying, well, our parents said the same things about us, but everybody will shout that down and say, that's different. What we changed needed to be changed, but this new stuff is really bad. <laughs> Basically expressing no faith that maybe your kids can negotiate their emerging, emerging culture the same way you negotiate 
associated yours. At least you get a little relief at the grocery store where your really edgy music is now playing all the time if it's subdued levels, maybe some Santana or Fleetwood Mac, and you think as you roll through the fruits and vegetables bobbing your head off beat, now this is good music. <laughs> Instead of thinking that, gee, maybe your really edgy music is playing in the grocery store because it's safe and boring now, like Perry Mason and the Lucy Show, instead of because it's good. But you're still so sure it's good that you and your friends keep running to concerts of Santana and Fleetwood Mac and the Rolling Stones, and you'll keep running until you, just like the bands, are wearing Depends adult diapers. <laughs> Meanwhile, back home, you're still trying to influence your kids. They don't reject everything about you, but they're different enough that when they're in their late teens and early 20s and you hear them talking to their friends, you understand the words, but think to yourself, what in the heck are they talking about? Soon even your wife is turning on you, trying to get you to wear straight leg pants like normal people. You feel the moral fiber leave your body when you try those pants on, which are not the true and natural shape of pants, but merely the latest fashion. In not too many years, you're concluding that the decline going all around you is perhaps the biggest such decline in the history of the world and that the end is near. You grumble at the theater, at the restaurant, or even in front of the TV, wishing things were as good as they once were. And in the end, you sound a lot like the venerable Yorge, the blind old monk in the name of the rose who hated change. Let us return to what was and ever should be the office of this savvy, the preservation of knowledge. Preservation, I say, not search for, because there is no progress in the history of knowledge, merely a continuous and sublime recapitulation. I, I've actually begun practicing that for 20 years so I can say that myself. No progress in the history of knowledge, merely a continuous and sublime recapitulation. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful thought. Two examples illustrate these competing generational attitudes better than words can. Anyway, those are the twin theme songs of every generation. I think you've heard the one by Archie Bunker. Even though the lyrics and music and costumes change, every generation sings both those songs, essentially. There's a new world coming, and those were the days, right? The good old days. And each generation will respond differently to them. From older people being alarmed by Mama Cass and the peace sign, to my generation feeling sentimental, and I mean, how can you hold still, you know, hearing Mama Cass, to younger generations maybe finding her coolly retro. Well, what studying really old history does is help you see beyond generational change and prejudices, and thus help you make sense of them. Most of us make our judgments about the religious and cultural change we see and how it fits into the whole history of the world based on the really short and egocentric perspective of our tiny lifetime. But if we take a closer look at change over the long haul, maybe we can think a little deeper about the changes going on around us and save ourselves a lot of money on Prozac too. Among other things, we begin to realize how hard it is to judge progress and decline or which generation is superior to another. You'd have to lay out all the deeds and values of every generation to draw reliable conclusions about this. And even if you manage to lay out those deeds, which generation's standard of right and wrong would you use to judge them? Every generation is pretty sure of its superiority, and yet every generation has, usually without knowing it, accepted as right things which previous generations thought were wrong and vice versa. For instance, in the mid-19th century, it was a good idea to put young boys in dresses for pictures, as you see with this boy here. This is a boy. It is Heber J. Grant in 1860. How many parents today might not think this is a good idea? Which one is right? You could, of course, call in some objective judge of right and wrong, and in the West, the favorite has been the Christian Bible. But that can be tricky, too, because interpretations of the Bible have themselves changed over the centuries. So if progress or decline don't necessarily explain change, what does? Scholars have tried some helpful, if jury-sounding theories like cohort replacement and informational cascades. I'm in the early stages of developing my own ideas, but so far I'm thinking that maybe it's helpful to understand change not as decline or progress necessarily, but as a sort of reconfiguration, or as the Book of Acts puts it, a time of refreshing. People start seeing old things differently and seeing new things because they ask new questions, often because of new conditions around them. Then they work their new way of seeing into a new system of right and wrong. I searched for a way to illustrate this idea visually and came up with an elaborate chart showing a system of dynamic reconfiguration, but decided that a better image was one my grandchildren might understand.
seeing isn't believing. And then it happens over and over again. It's ideas like this that help you to get to be an outstanding scholar. Uh, I won't go through every configuration over time, but highlight a few changes in Western Christian culture alone. We can start with something as simple as language. My good-hearted mother sometimes washed our mouths out with soap when we used slang words she thought were bad. So imagine my surprise when I learned decades later that some of the slang words she used herself were originally obscene. Now, I won't repeat them so I don't torment her or anyone else, because heavy is the burden of historical knowledge. <laughs> that at a recent BYU devotional, the fairly young speaker used a word that originally was even more obscene than my mother's favorites. And no one batted an eye, because to the speaker and most of the audience, it was just a fun noun. Or how about the phrase, good grief, so wholesome that even Charlie Brown says it. Turns out it's just another minced swear word with the good referring to God, as it does in any minced swear word containing good. In fact, there are hundreds of such words, and most of us here tonight probably say some of them regularly without thinking ourselves bad, which I know because I and the rest of the historical police hear you. <laughs> Or how about left-handedness, which for centuries in the West was not seen as just another hand, but as a problem, and even the evil hand. The Latin word for left is sinister, the French word for left is crude, and so on. Any child who preferred the left hand was unusually willful and deliberately perverse. Religious rituals favored the right hand. A toast of ill will was a left-handed toast. A subtle insult was a left-handed compliment. Ambidextrous did not mean using both hands equally, but having two right hands. Right wasn't just directional, but moral, clear into the 20th century until people began to view left-handedness as just another form of handedness. Left-handedness itself didn't change, but how it was seen changed. Who would have thought that polyphonic music was ever bad? The church preferred plain chant, everyone singing the same note and same word at the same time. Polyphony, or singing different notes and different words at the same or different times, was worldly. And you can see it here in this example with everybody coming in at different moments on different notes. But around 900, some church composers believed it was possible to bring polyphony into religious music. Many churchmen resisted, especially when third and sixth intervals were involved, because they were seen as sensuous and not conducive to holy thoughts. As you can see just from the title of this secular song, I gave her cake. Yet the single most famous piece of polyphony in the Christian West, Handel's Messiah, is now considered a religious piece, even though Handel himself considered it secular and had it performed in concert halls and theaters, not in church. All those people singing different notes, coming in at different times, all the thirds and sixths, it makes you want to run from the hall and renounce religion. But instead, <laughs> we hear a supremely religious work of music because our taste in good religious music are different from the Middle Ages. Beyond these changes were bigger ones that did seem to turn the world upside down and shake the foundations and tear up the roots, which is the root meaning of the word radical. We might go along with changes in music or language or fashion and even be glad about changes in science and technology, but changes in what we were sure had always been right and wrong, these can make us start fainting and groaning and having heart attacks like the delegates listening to Khrushchev's secret speech in 1956. There's no footage of the secret speech, so this is the best I could find. Changes like this are simply unimaginable, but they've occurred anyway, even though they sometimes take gener several generations to do so because they are so big. Some of these changes don't seem big to us because they're distant. In fact, they can make us chuckle or smirk because they seem so obviously right to us now. But we can think that only because earlier generations made them part of a new configuration of values that eventually became part of our own configuration without our even realizing it. At the time, these unimaginable changes were every bit as big as any unimaginable change in your own world. Early big changes were plentiful in the New Testament as in the book of Acts. There, Peter, a devout Jew who believed he'd found the Messiah, had a famous dream in which a big sheet full of four-footed animals descended upon him. A voice told him to eat those animals, but Peter insisted he couldn't because God had said they were common and unclean. But the voice responded, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Peter must have felt completely schizophrenic. God was telling him to eat what Peter assumed God had said not to eat. He was so astonished he had to be told three times. 
Peter interpreted the dream to mean that the Gentiles weren't as unclean as he thought. In fact, that God had put no difference between us and them, quote, unquote. And that it was fine to let the Gentiles hear the good news about Jesus the Messiah. When other Jesus-following Jews heard the news about Gentiles, they were astonished too, including James, the brother of Jesus. Paul of Tarsus also said he had a vision from God about the Gentiles, but this dream went further than Peter's and further than what James, the brother of Jesus, envisioned too. Most followers of Jesus still thought of themselves as Jews who had found their Messiah, which meant they continued to follow Jewish law. It was fine for Gentiles to convert, but it was also assumed that it would mean they too had to follow Jewish law. Paul had other ideas. Going to the Gentiles meant adapting certain things to them, and so he said that Gentile converts would not have to divorce their Gentile spouses, for instance, that it was okay to eat meat sacrificed to pagan idols because idols weren't real anyway, and that maybe circumcision was asking a little much. Maybe many Jewish followers of Jesus were horrified, and debates broke out, as they always do when change threatens. Conferences were held, agreements were struck, Paul continued on, and his version of things gradually became the most popular. But the story wasn't over. The latest research on the book of Revelation shows that followers of Jesus were still arguing for generations, and that one of the loudest critics was none other than John of Patmos, the revelator. Like Peter and Paul, John had a vision too, a famous one, of the end of the world. But the end that he foresaw wasn't in some future time. It was of John's own world. It was going to hell, and God was about to take out his wrath on it. And why? Not just because of the wickedness of pagan Rome, but also because some followers of Jesus had compromised with Rome and corrupted true religion, like Paul and his disciples. Elaine Pagels concludes that even though the book of Revelation and Paul's epistles ended up happily under the same New Testament cover, they reflect two competing visions of what Jesus' messages meant. John linked adapters with pagans and the devil. To him, the changes were as shocking as it would be for Mormons to hear that their health code was fine, but not really important, or that all that temple work was dandy, but not really necessary. To Gentile converts, however, the, the adaptations made by Paul weren't compromises at all. They were necessary and inspired changes. The version of the gospel promoted by John was old-fashioned. Gentile converts could, of course, play the moral superiority card, too, and also condemn compromising with the world. They just had different ideas than John about what that meant. Gentile converts insisted, for instance, that true Christians, as they were beginning to call themselves, should not use the word Sunday to refer to the first day of the week when they got together to remember Jesus. Modern English-speaking Christians have no problem saying Sunday or calling Sunday the Sabbath, but ancient Gentile Christians would have been horrified that we use either term. Sa Sunday, the day of the sun, was a pagan day, and to say it was to compromise with Rome. Real Christians should call it the Lord's Day, which is still reflected in most Romance languages, descended from the Latin that ancient Christians spoke. So you can see versions of the Lord's Day uh, in Spanish, Portuguese, French, Catalan, Italian, and so on. Sunday certainly was not the Sabbath, which fell the day before on the Roman Saturn Day, and was more and more just for Jews, to whom Christians felt increasingly superior. This is also reflected in modern Romance languages, so variants on Sabbath. But it wasn't just that the Sabbath fell on another day. More fundamentally, it was that Christians boasted that unlike Jews, they didn't need a special day of the week to remind them to worship God. Every day was holy to a Christian. Ancient Christians didn't necessarily celebrate a Sabbath. Views of using the word Sunday started changing after 600, as Christianity moved into Germanic Northern Europe. Speakers of Germanic languages, including English, just kept using the term Sunday when they converted because it didn't have the same unchristian connotation to them that it had to Southerners. Also by this time, Christians had decided that one way to show their superiority to Jews was to observe their own special Lord's Day even more rigor rigorously than Jews observed the Sabbath. Some even began calling the Lord's Day a sort of Christian Sabbath. But by the time of my beloved 16th century, English Puritans insisted that the Sabbath had actually been transferred to Sunday by divine decree. And so, for English speakers, Sabbath and Sunday came to be synonymous and religious and good. But ancient Christians might regard us as complete slackers or heretics for saying them. Even more stunning to ancient and medieval Christians would have been the Christian acceptance after 1500 of lending money at interest, and that churches would someday be filled with bankers. For 1500 years, usury was prohibited in the Christian West on the basis of various Old Testament texts, and could even result in automatic excommunication. The Christian ideal was to lend out a brotherly love. Charging extra was a form of economic oppression and not just another sin, but one of the biggest sins. Dante put usurers in the lowest circle of his inferno and everyone understood why. Then a funny thing happened. As more and more cities emerged after 1,000, so did more and more merchants and so did the need for more credit. 
Even to Christian merchants, it made sense that paying a little interest on a loan was a fair trade-off for the risk involved. And around 1500, Europe experienced its first period of inflation, causing some to argue that charging interest was necessary just to break even. In other words, new conditions caused people to question old, apparently unchangeable assumptions and to develop a new system of values around it. Even that great lover of the Bible, John Calvin, saw reason to reinterpret things, and he did so by using a historical argument. Conditions in 16th century Europe were different from those in ancient Israel. The historical approach would become, maybe to Calvin's horror, one of the founding principles of biblical interpretation in later centuries. A text had to be read in its original context to draw out the lasting meaning. The specific rule wasn't necessarily lasting, but the bigger and unspoken principle behind it was. The implication was huge. Something that had been assumed to be a lasting ideal in the Bible might simply be a temporary rule. And if that was true of usury, maybe it was true of other biblical precepts too. The idea was articulated fully 300 years later by Samuel Holdheim, the first reformed Jewish rabbi of Berlin. A law, even though divine, is potent only so long as the conditions and circumstances of life to meet which it was enacted continue. When these change, however, the law also must be abrogated, even though it have God for its author. For God himself has shown indubitably that with the change of the circumstances and conditions of life for which he once gave those laws, the laws themselves cease to be operative. And so the texts on usury were reinterpreted to mean that usury could now be good if it promoted brotherly love, if it helped the borrower and not just the lender, and if the interest rate was not excessive. By 1650, all Protestants agreed, and by 1750, Catholics did too. Future generations would be mostly unaware usury had even been an issue in the past. But most Christians before 1500 would have been stunned by usury's respectability, or by the later idea that fair interest rates and prices should be determined by some invisible hand based on what people were willing to pay, rather than by some just standard determined by Christian morals. Another biblical precept which people thought wouldn't change was the nature of the universe. For almost 2,000 years, the Christian West accepted that the earth was at the center of all things and that heavenly bodies were perfectly smooth crystalline spheres. This was based partly on those classical giants Ptolemy and Aristotle, and partly on Christian authority, especially six or seven texts of the Bible. But in 1540, Nicholas Copernicus concluded that putting the sun at the center of the universe explained heavenly motion better than the earth at the center did. It was Galileo who popularized the idea, though, through witty dialogues he wrote after 1600. It was also Galileo who first thought of turning the newly invented microscope on the heavens. No one had ever thought of that before, because there was no need. Everyone assumed that the heavens were already understood. And what he saw was stunning. The sun had spots on it. The surface of the moon was irregular, and Jupiter had moons. Jupiter could not have moons, because everything orbited only around the Earth. These are sunspots here. Galileo never lacked for confidence, but he would not simply reject the Bible. So he first used a historical argument, saying that, though the Bible was better on sub, uh, saying that though the Bible could never err, it's not always obvious what the meaning is. He also argued that the Bible was better on some subjects, like spirituality, than on others, like nature. In fact, if there was a contradiction between our observations of nature and what the Bible said about nature, we should prefer our observations. That one really got him in trouble. Finally, he also used the argument that the Bible must be interpreted in light of new knowledge that emerges. He said, I declare that we do have in our age new events and observations such that if Aristotle were now alive, I have no doubt he would change his opinion. And, unquote, and maybe the writers of the Bible too. Some churchmen, especially those favorable towards science, were interested in Galileo's ideas, but insisted he present them merely as theory, not as reality. Most churchmen, though, simply insisted that putting the sun at the center of the universe was, quote, without any doubt against scripture, unquote. And anyone who said otherwise were, were proud men of the world, unquote, who thought they knew better than scripture or all the holy fathers. This wasn't just a scientific matter then, but a spiritual one. As Cardinal Bellarmine put it, the problem was not to expand scripture, but to defend it against error. Another cardinal famously refused to look at the heavens through Galileo's telescope, fearing it was a trick but perhaps more deeply because he feared what he might see. It simply could not be true. For a host of reasons, the church condemned Galileo in 1633 and placed his writings on the index of prohibited books. The church championed instead the ideas of the Jesuit astronomer Clavius, who elegantly defended the traditional Earth-centered universe. Galileo's ideas were too much change for most people. The English poet John Donne expressed that feeling most memorably. 
Sorry for this. The sun is lost and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. But the new universe won over most educated people by 1700 and others by 1900. In 1835, the Catholic Church took Galileo's writings off of the index and in 1992 formally admitted that he'd been right. Pope John Paul II even commended Galileo for, quote, adjusting scriptural interpretation in light of new knowledge, unquote, unlike the theologians of the time. It's easy to think now that, of course, Galileo was right, but had we lived then, we likely would not have thought so. Even though Galileo's ideas were long condemned, his approach to scripture of, understand, of interpreting it in light of new knowledge had a big influence. An even more famous example this way was the abolition of slavery. Maybe the best reason not to argue that an idea or practice should continue just because it's been around a long time is slavery. Slavery had been around seemingly forever when some Western Christians began to oppose it in the 18th century, setting off a debate in the US that lasted into the Civil War. The most striking thing about the debates to us might be that those in favor of slavery had the best biblical arguments. Both Old and New Testaments assumed the existence of slavery and never condemn it. They condemn only masters who treat slaves badly. Quote, the Bible teaches clearly and conclusively that the holding of slaves is right, unquote, said advocates of slavery, who could cite numerous passages specifically saying so. The Baptist minister, Thornton Stringfellow, wrote in 1860 that God approved slavery not only in the Bible, but in the, quote, only national constitution which ever emanated from God, unquote. And since God was the same yesterday, today, and forever, then it followed that slavery had to be the same too. In fact, anyone in favor of freedom and equality for all, as the Declaration of Independence declared, was essentially rejecting the Bible itself, said Stringfellow, because the Bible was full of sanctioned inequality. Those against slavery weren't simply going to ignore the Bible, of course, no more than Galileo or John Calvin would have. They knew they didn't have any passages on their side to specifically condemn slavery. Their strategy instead was to emphasize passages about human relationships in general, such as the Golden Rule, or Acts 17, God has made one blood of all nations, or God created all in his own image, and other family of man sorts of texts. They also might use the historical approach. Biblical passages in favor of slavery reflected the understanding of past societies rather than of some enduring practice. Or they relied on, quote, the general tenor of scripture, as they called it. That's where lasting principles were to be found, not in specific rules for a specific time and place. Some Christians went even further and said slavery had never been right to begin with, but was simply allowed by God because of human weakness. After slavery ended, former slaves and their descendants were still treated as inferior people, even by many Northerners opposed to slavery. This view, based on various biblical passages, said that races should therefore not mix in any intimate way, such as in housing or schooling or eating or especially marriage. Mixed marriage was said to be contrary to nature and to God's will. The purity of public morals, said a Virginia court in 1875, require that the two races should be kept distinct and separate. And these attitudes lasted a long time. My own grandmother, another good-hearted Christian, expressed surprisingly vicious views of racial mixing, but she wasn't alone. When the Supreme Court finally struck down laws against interracial marriage in 1967, 81% of Americans were still against it, as you can see on this graph. We can almost hear them saying, well, obviously slavery was bad, but racial mixing, that's another thing altogether. Still, in a couple of generations, momentum had turned. By 2011, 86% of Americans approved of interracial marriage. And within another generation or two, many people will likely forget how unacceptable it used to be, or imagine that only bad people opposed it. If we list on the screen all the changes mentioned so far, we would again not be terribly impressed, right? Some of the slang words you say, these were all wrong. Left-handedness, polyphony, taking the gospel to the Gentiles, you know, who cared if these things changed? We would all think these were good changes. Of course, there are some holdouts to this. Um, this guy, Galileo was wrong and the church was right. This is a very recently published book. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's hard to imagine, how earth-shattering these changes once were and how much debate they provoked, we can at least grasp this. By accepting these changes ourselves, we, like them, accept some things in the Bible as written and reject other things, even though we may not think about it. This is also true of big and often unimaginable possible changes discussed in more recent decades, though on these subjects there would be much less argument and a lot more sensitivity. If I list some of these on the board, I'm not going to spend as much time on these precisely because there is not consensus about them in the Christian West. But in short, some Christians have found ways to reconcile changes in these areas into their beliefs. Others contend it's just not possible. 
Many Christians in the late 19th century thought that the observations of nature which led to the idea of evolution were completely incompatible with the Bible. But other Christians came to think otherwise. It depended, they said, as usual, on how you read the Bible. The creation account may have simply reflected understanding of the time, or it wasn't even meant to be scientific, but was a morality tale instead, with the moral being that God was above nature, unlike the polytheistic gods around Israel who were within nature. But many American Christians despise the sort of fancy Bible reading. In fact, evolution seems to have been the last straw because biblical literalism seems to, uh, bi biblical literalism arose right when evolution did. 46% of Americans, most of them Christians, still don't believe in human evolution. 32% of Americans, most of them Christian too, believe that evolution was God's way of doing things. Maybe the biggest constant subject to debate over the centuries has been women and just about anything. Women shouldn't study too much, said educators and moralists from the Middle Ages uh, forward, because, said one 17th century Frenchman, their brains might explode. Plus, it didn't suit their nature, which was for bearing and raising children. Plus, if women cared too much about learning, they would neglect home and family and society would crumble. Women shouldn't lead or preach in churches either, said others, because the priest represented God and God was a man, even though the Orthodox God had no body, parts, or passions. Women couldn't run the 10,000 meters either, much less the marathon, or pole vault, or play full court basketball because their bodies weren't made for it. And a special version of basketball invented just for girls in the early 20th century, which I watched my older sister play at church in the 1960s. She's here tonight, she can confirm this. Most girls were not allowed to run the whole court. Um, two stayed on the offensive side at all times, two on the defensive side, and only the two most athletic girls were allowed, daringly allowed, to run the whole court. Plus many other now curious rules too lengthy to mention, like you couldn't guard someone within three feet. But the rules mostly reflect the usual concern for women's reproductive abilities and the usual low expectations of what women could do physically. Some women's issues, of course, there's still fuss about. But on those I've mentioned, we wonder why there was a fuss, and have even forgotten there was. I'm surprised, for instance, by how many of my female students at BYU feel the need to declare, I am not a feminist, making me wonder what they mean by the term, since these students take for granted that equal opportunity at school and the workplace and school sports are good things. I'm also surprised by the growing number of co-ed bathrooms I encounter now in the US, or maybe I shouldn't be, because one of the fears expressed by making women equal to men, more equal to men, was that there would be co-ed bathrooms. But I stumbled across one last week at my oddly configured church. There was an image of a door, there was a, uh, there was a door with an image of both a man and a woman on it, indicated by obviously church approved signs. You know, you can't miss that logo and that, that kind of font. At first I thought it was a bathroom for the disabled, but it was located on the second floor and there was no elevator up there. Then I thought it must be a family bathroom, but again there were just the male and female figures and no changing table inside. I looked for people picketing outside. I, I looked for parents covering children's eyes as they walked past, but there was nothing. It was just an ordinary co-ed bathroom at church and no one cared. I couldn't believe it, so I went in. Vaccination was a really big issue when it emerged in the 18th century, prompting shootings and bombings at times. I mean, we've had a revival of some people being opposed to vaccination, but most people, I, I mean, there is some controversy about it. Those against it insisted that deliberately giving someone a disease had to be ungodly, while Christians in favor of vaccination insisted it was a gift from God. The argument over birth control that began in the 19th century went much the same way. It seemed to be against life and to be playing God, said opponents, while a lot of Christian women showed at least by their actions that they considered it to be a gift from God. This was of course related to changes in sexual mores generally, changes in understanding of homosexual relations as well, which went from the, from this chart, from 40% approval in 2001 to 54% in 2012, with perhaps predictably a huge gap between the younger and older generations. And there is arguing over the proper Christian approach to the environment. For all of these subjects, the Bible is used by people on both or all sides, with those having specific passages on their side, insisting that they be read at face value, and those without such passages emphasizing texts about human relationships and dignity or, quote, the general tenor of scripture. Well, these are a lot of subjects, and I apologize uh, for mentioning so many, but there are far more than this, and there will doubtless be many more in the future. 
My point hasn't been to suggest that every change is necessarily good or that everything will necessarily change or what's the right way to think about the proposed changes or, but, but to offer some perspective on the debates over change. We don't have to feel like we are being uniquely and cosmically picked on because of changes we don't like in our own time. We don't have to feel like change is the end of the world. It may indeed be the end of our generation's world, but not necessarily the world. We don't have to immediately conclude that the changes we see in our lifetime are the worst ever in history, but can actually go study a little history and see pretty fast that worst ever has a lot of company in every century. We can also find plenty of company in what we consider good things, even in younger generations. And we can get out of the centuries old habit of insisting that the old days were always better. Even in the Old Testament, people were saying that. In Ecclesiastes, say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Just like Carly Simon said, these are the good old days. President Hinckley said it too. When asked whether the 50s were better than today, he said, I think the 50s were a good time, and I think this is a great time. I don't think we've retrograded. The point isn't that there aren't awful things around us, but that we're not unusual that way. And the point is to make the best of our particular situation. Speaking as a historian, change seems to be one constant we can count on. And speaking as a believer, maybe that's the way it should be. How dull it would be and how little we would learn if the point of life was only to jump through hoops already set up for us rather than for us to help create life. There's nothing wrong with having a system of right and wrong, obviously. And old systems shouldn't be casually discarded just because they're old. There's nothing even wrong in liking our particular system or in disagreeing with others over what changes should occur. But seeing the big picture of change over time should make us more inclined to disagree humbly with an attitude that we might be right, or sorry, that we might be wrong and others right, rather than with so much certainty that we're right. Because all that big past change should make us reflect that maybe all the things we're so certain about might end up floating away like white puffs of dandelion on summer breezes, just like so many other things. In fact, it's a good bet that future generations will shake their heads, not only at what, what were you doing with your hair or with those pants, but what were you thinking about this or that? But we don't have to feel too badly about that or even rejected. One interesting theory of generational change says that change doesn't occur so much because the younger generation rejects the older, but because the younger generation extends the values it learns from the older into new and unfamiliar territory. Thus, for instance, a Mormon child who learned in the 1950s that people deserve to be treated equally might in the 1970s take that further and urge that black people receive the priesthood, though his or her parents might have disagreed. Speaking of which, we Mormons are, of course, familiar with change, too. We've argued over every one of these subjects I've mentioned, starting with slavery, and have seen change occur in every one as well. Charles Harrell of the BYU faculty just published a book that shows changes in Mormon doctrine from beginning to present. Tom Alexander here tonight published an article showing the same thing in the late 19th and early 20th century. Just two weeks ago, dozens of changes were made in LDS scriptures to make historical context of them more clear. But this doesn't have to disturb us. Mormons don't officially believe in inerrancy, and change doesn't necessarily mean errancy anyway. In fact, the belief in continuing revelation could make Mormons, in theory, more radical believers in change than most others. But even to us, change can feel threatening, as was evident in probably our two most radical changes, the ending of polygamy and the priesthood ban. Growing up, I knew little about polygamy, just vague impressions that ending it hadn't been a big deal and was obviously necessary, and not that many people had been involved anyway, which all turned out to be wrong. But I remember the change to the priesthood ban very well and that it was indeed a big deal because I lived through it and experience changed within myself. The first black person I knew was a girl named Crystal in third grade. And I remember wanting to say something really nice about her and I came up with, she's pretty smart for a Negro. I didn't learn that from my parents who never talked that way, but from my cultural DNA. In junior high and high school, I changed that view as I came to have several black friends and even began to wonder about the priesthood ban. At the mission home in 1975, we were handed a thick packet containing various teachings by church authorities that affirmed the priesthood ban in the unlikely event that we ran into any black people in Belgium and assumed, you know, I assumed these must be right. After I got home, though, I stood in a store in Fresno in the spring of 1978 and based partly on my experience with my friends, partly on what my parents taught me about the value of all people and their inviting over to dinner the only black Mormon I ever knew as a boy, and partly on the general tenor of what I'd been preaching on my mission, I suddenly realized I did not believe black people were inferior and thus I could not understand the priesthood ban. Just like Peter, I felt like God had put no difference between me and them ever. I wasn't alone in thinking this way, of course, or even particularly virtuous, because, of course, black people already knew this, and also because a lot of other people were thinking this too, including a few really old Mormons like Spencer W. Kimball. 
It was easy for me to reconsider old assumptions about race because my whole generation was reconsidering assumptions, but not his. The process he went through is described in an article in BYU Studies from 2008 by his son Edward. President Kimball wasn't waiting passively for God, as we might imagine the process of big revelations working, but actively sought it out. He thought about the ban since 1961 and had been against lifting it, but after he became prophet, he started considering it again. He knew by now that Joseph Smith had ordained black people. He knew about the complications the policy was causing in Brazil, where the church was growing fast. But most of all, he began questioning his own assumptions. During the first months of 1978, he went almost daily to the temple to pray about it, and it was in great torment. And what was he praying for? Not for a revelation so much, but to get over his assumptions. Quote, day after day, I went there when I could be alone. I was very humble. I was searching. I had a great deal to fight, myself largely, because I had grown up with this thought that Negroes should not have the priesthood, and I was prepared to go all the rest of my life until my death and fight for it and defend it as it was." Unquote. Defend, fight, the usual language and postures we think of when we think of the religious hero standing up for the truth. But President Kimball was the hero in this whole matter, not because he stood up for his beliefs, but because even in his age, he reconsidered them. Unlike the Cardinal, who wouldn't look through Galileo's telescope, President Kimball was willing to look and to ask. He later wrote about the incident, revelations will probably never come unless they are desired. Or as President Hinckley later put it, he was not the first to worry about the priesthood question, but he had the compassion to pursue it and a boldness that allowed him to get the revelation, unquote. And just like Peter, he was astonished when it came. Most everyone I knew was thrilled about the change and pretty predictably, within a generation or so, young people didn't understand what a big deal it had been. In a few more generations, I wouldn't be surprised if they forgot it altogether. When younger people hear older people occasionally express some of the unfortunate older attitudes, young people are stunned because they can't imagine that anyone holding those attitudes could possibly have ever been a good Mormon, which puts you on the road, of course, to thinking that you figured everything out. As a historian and as a believer, I find President Kimball's attitude a much better one and an example for us as we too ponder and debate possible changes in our world. And that's what really old history is good for, and what I would have said to the van driver if I would have had as much time with him as I had tonight. Thanks for listening.